Happy Sunday, Cornerstone. My name is Alex Johnston, and it is my joy to be with you in worship today, wherever you are. Now, I don't know if you know this, but in two weeks, we're going to be celebrating Easter Sunday as a church. It's hard to believe that it's come up this fast, and we have lots of opportunities over the next few weeks for you to engage in the message of Easter. But I wanna tell you about one in particular, and that's our Palm Sunday for Families event. It's happening next Sunday on Palm Sunday at 1015 in Arden Forest. Parents, if you're looking for a way to help your kids connect to the heart of what it means to celebrate Easter, then this event is for you. So head to hbmc.org and register today and save your spot to join us for this Palm Sunday for Families event. It's going to be so much fun. You don't want to miss it. Now again, we're gonna have lots of ways for you to celebrate all throughout Holy Week leading up to Easter Sunday morning. But of course, the crown jewel is Easter itself. And last year, we didn't get to be together in person to celebrate Easter. So this year, we're doing something extra special. At 10 a.m. on Easter morning, we're going to head to SMU's Ford Stadium and celebrate together as one church. Thousands of us all in the same place. Now, we're going to be socially distant. It's an open air venue, and we're also gonna be wearing masks. So we hope you'll join us. We're gonna celebrate in the resurrection. It's one of the most special times in the whole year for Christians. So would you consider joining us? You can register at hbmc.org slash Easter. Now, if you've been attending HBMC for a while and you're looking for a way to take your next step or get more involved, I wanna talk to you for just a second because we can't really do this Easter thing without you. We need over a hundred volunteers to help us out at Ford Stadium on Easter Sunday morning to make that experience welcoming and inviting for all of our guests and visitors who are going to come. So if you're interested in joining our hospitality team at 10 o'clock on Sunday for Easter, would you go to hbmc.org Easter and look for the volunteer button and you can sign up to serve with us on Easter Sunday morning. Now, Hannah has prepared an incredible message for you this morning. So will you sit back, take a deep breath, and invite God to join you in your space wherever you are as you prepare to worship today. Hey, Cornerstone, good morning. Welcome to worship. For those of you who were on spring break last week, I hope your week was restful. I hope it was fun. My week was neither of those things because we moved. It's like a block and a half from our current house, but it still required us to pack everything into boxes, load up a truck, and move down the street. We weren't planning on moving. We love our house. We love our neighborhood. But uh, one day, about two months ago, I was out on a walk with our kids. I was wheeling our stroller up a hill, and I noticed to my right this house, and I, I didn't know, but the family had moved out. There was a sign that said coming soon, but that wasn't what caught my attention. It was the chicken coop in the backyard. I thought, this is a great way to pass time with kids, so let's go. So I rolled the kids up into their yard, and we're standing at the chicken coop. My kids are dropping pebbles in through the chicken wire. And I turned around and realized this lot was huge. It's a double lot. And at our house, we have a tiny lot. It's a side yard that backs up against a busy street and with two toddlers. We just didn't feel like it was safe. So in this moment, I looked around and thought, I mean, could we buy this? Like, could this be the house for us? So over a matter of weeks, Ryan and I prayed about it and thought about it and crunched the numbers and met with a realtor. And sure enough, we closed on the house and we moved in. And we bought it because I had all of these fantasies and ideas about what our family could be like in this home. What kind of memories we would create with little kids running out to collect eggs in the morning and a treehouse we could build in the back. 
We've been in the house for five days, and it hasn't been anything like this. Our kids have actually had a hard time. And on Tuesday night, Eliza woke up at two in the morning, like broad daylight for her. And I climbed up the stairs sleepily, and I crawled in bed next to her, and she said, I don't like this house because you pay attention to everyone but me. She's three and a half. And I realized she was right. Because I had been pawning her off on my parents and Ryan's parents, just trying to get her out of the way so I could do what I really wanted, which was to unpack and to decorate and to feel settled. But what I realized is building a house is about so much more than square footage and lot size. That actually making a home is about soul and memories and seeing one another and caring for each other. And I'd missed it just in the first week of being in this house. I'd missed it. All of us are building something. For some of us in the year that we've had, it's actually more like a rebuilding. You may not be building a home. You may be building a relationship, whether it's a friendship or a romance. You may be building a team at work or a company on a bigger scale. All of us are building something. And what I realized this week is that there's two ways to build. We can choose to build with God or without God. I don't know about you, but if those are the choices, I'd rather build with God. So my question this morning is, whatever we're building, how do we build in a way that God will be with us, that God is pleased and that God is for us, so that God is part of what we're building? If you've been reading Exodus with us in this reading plan, you know that we just came through five chapters of detailed building instructions like of measurements and dimensions and materials. And it's part of the Bible that in the past, I probably would have just skipped over or skimmed. It seems kind of boring and detailed and dry, and I don't really know how it applies to me. But this time around, I forced myself to slow down, to pay attention, to sink deeper into the story. And I discovered something so interesting and so beautiful. I can't wait to share it with you. So we're going to pray, and then we're just going to jump right in. Will you pray with me? Lord, would you be with us as we read your story, as we think about how it applies to our lives, and as we reflect on what it looks like to move forward in light of the truths that you are speaking to us? So would you speak and help us listen? Amen. Okay, so, so far in Exodus, I mean, grab your Bible or your Exodus journal if you have it, but so far in Exodus, God has delivered his people from slavery in a dramatic rescue through plagues and Pharaoh saying, let my people go, and he crosses through the Red Sea on dry land. They all go through, and at this point in the story, the people of Israel are camped out in the wilderness at the base of Mount Sinai, and it's, in, it's on the mountain that God speaks. And he tells Israel through Moses, he tells them his plan for them. He says, if you'll listen to my voice and obey my commands, then you will be my treasured possession above all people. You, Israel, this tiny nation of fugitive slaves, you will be my choice, my treasured possession. Because all the earth is mine, but you will be mine. He says, I'm going to make you a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Now, for me, like a kingdom of priests kind of sounds boring and remote, but what he means is, I'm going to make you a picture of me to the whole world. So what I'm doing with you, Israel, through interacting with you by my law, by these things we're doing together in the wilderness, are going to make you my hands and feet in the world so that everybody who watches will be blessed. Everybody who sees you, who comes face to face with Israel, will actually come face to face with God and be blessed through it. So God gives them the law. First, the Ten Commandments, or they call it the Ten Words in Hebrew, followed by a series of ordinances, which are basically principles or laws on how the Israelites are supposed to deal with each other in their relationships with their slaves and with surrounding nations. He sets this up as the terms of his covenant. We're going to be in a binding relationship. If you obey me, I will bless you and make you my prize. And the people of Israel say, I'm all in. Let's do it. We agree. 
And then Moses, in celebration, goes up to the mountain with Aaron, his brother, and a couple other elders. They feast and drink in the presence of God. And then Moses alone goes up to the mountain where it says the cloud of the Lord descended, the presence of God. It was thick. And he spends 40 days and 40 nights in the presence of God where God gives him instructions about something he has to build. We're going to pick up in Exodus 25. Go ahead and open with me. Right at the top of Exodus 25. The Lord said to Moses, Speak to the people of Israel that they take from me a contribution. From every man whose heart moves him, you shall receive the contribution from me. And this is the contribution that you shall receive from them. Gold, silver, and bronze, blue and purple and scarlet yarns and fine twisted linen, goat's hair, tanned ram skins, goat skins, acacia wood, oil for the lamps, spices for the anointing oil and for the fragrant incense, onyx stones and stones for setting, for the ephod and for the breastpiece. And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell in their midst. Underline that last line in your Bible. Let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell in their midst. So God is asking for this offering for all the people to combine the ingredients they have, the supplies, because he wants them to build a sanctuary. Now we hear sanctuary and we think like the traditional part of the church over there with stained glass and pews. But this really just means a dwelling place, a house. God wants a place to dwell among his people. And my first question is, if God is everywhere, why does he need a place, much less a building? I don't actually know the answer, but it's clear that God wants a particular place to show up and dwell with his people. It doesn't mean that if God is in the sanctuary, he's not everywhere else, but there's a particular way that he shows up in this space. And that's what he wants to do. He wants to dwell among his people, to be there in their presence. Here's what strikes me about this passage, though. It's at the very first line. So far in Genesis and Exodus, everything has sort of been a command from God. It's compulsory. Do this. Do that. Everybody should do this. Everybody should pick up and walk across the land. But not here in this moment. Did you catch that? Did you catch what he says? He says, from every man whose heart moves him. In other words, if you are moved, if you want this, If you want to build the sanctuary where I will dwell and be with you, here's what I need you to do. And it's clear then that there's a choice. They have a choice and we have a choice. That we can choose to use our materials to build a place where God will dwell. It's not a mandate. It's an invitation. So this is for them like, thousands of years ago, give him all the list of onyx for the breast piece, all the stones, all the wood, all the goat skins. (laughs) What are you building? You're not building a temple in the wilderness with goat skins and wood. But what are you building? And if you want to build it in a way that God will dwell, that God will take up residence and be with you, the first thing we do is offer him all of the pieces Offer him all of the things that go into building what it is we're building. Literally, like dump him on the table or take out a piece of paper and scratch it down and say, okay, God, this is yours. Here's what I'm building. This is all yours. What do you want with it? We'll go back to this idea of building a home. For Ryan and me as building a home for our family, there's like the basic elements of this family are Ryan and me. So we sit down and we offer ourselves to God and say, okay, Lord, you've made us parents. We are the ingredients to this family. What do you want with us? And then, this is going to make us sound like way holier than we are. We haven't done it yet, but this is where I have been feeling convicted reading this story. If we look at this house that we've been blessed with, look at something as concrete as the kitchen. God, who do you want us to feed in this space? Who do you want us to nourish and nurture and care for around this stove and this island and this table? And for our living room, God, what conversations need to be had in this space? What neighbors or friends or strangers need to be brought in to sit in this couch and be listened to? 
These are all of the little pieces and parts of what we're hoping to build. Will you take them and will you bless them? If it's that we're building a team at work, what goes into that? Well, for me, when I think about the kind of team I want to build, the first thing that goes into it is just my time. So I start by offering God my time and saying, okay, Lord, at work today, how do you want me to use my time in service of this team? I think about my team members and I pray for them and I consider their gifts and I say, Lord, this person is yours and this person is yours. How can I value them and see them beyond just what they produce for this organization? How can I see them and know them and remember that they belong to you? So if you want God to be part of what it is you're building, if you want God to dwell in it, the first thing we do is offer up the parts, offer up the pieces. I know it sounds simple. It's really just a matter of naming and handing it over, recognizing it's all God's to begin with. But that process is so powerful when we are moved and willing to invite God in, not because he just wags his finger and says, you should do it, you should do it, but because he's offering himself to us to be part of the building process. So name it, then offer him the pieces. Once that happens in the story, God gives Moses instructions. And rather than read you like chapters of what he's supposed to build, I want to show you a picture. This is a replica of the tabernacle structure. It's actually in Israel. So I'm going to explain kind of what's happening here, and I'm going to show you a diagram. So this is the outer fence and the walls, and everybody, of course, would be camped around. The tabernacle was supposed to be in the center of the camp, which is the place typically reserved for kings, which means that for Israel, they don't actually have a personal king. They have a personal God who is their king. So if you were going to come into the tabernacle, you'd come through the entrance, which is over here, and the first thing you would see is an altar. And the people of God would have to go forward and slaughter an animal. They'd lay down their animal sacrifice, which was common for the ancient Near East, not really common for us, so it's kind of gross or appalling. But this would be a way that they're paying for their sin, that they recognize that they have things they've got to work through, that they have done wrong against God and wrong against each other, and the animal is actually taking their place as payment for their sin. Then, from the altar, they would go to this wash basin, and the wash basin is where they would literally clean up after the sacrifice, but it was a symbol of being made pure, of being made clean, and it wasn't until then, and only really the priests at this point, they could go into the tent. Now, let me show you this. This is a diagram that's actually on our Exodus page. If you go to hpmc.org slash Exodus, you can see a little bit closer. But this explains all of the parts. So again, here is the altar where the animal sacrifice was made. Here is the wash basin where you would wash yourself clean. And then this is what's happening in the tent. Again, I told you that if I used to read the Bible, like in this passage, I would just sort of breeze through it. But pay attention. So here in one corner is a lampstand. We know it now as a menorah, but the instructions where that they would build this lampstand that's ornate and elaborate, like a stem with branches and, and flowers coming up off of it that would light the space, which would be pretty dark because of the curtains. And then in this corner, there's a table where the priests would offer bread, 12 loaves of bread, one for each tribe of Israel, as an offering of thanks and remembrance that God had provided for them. So they'd bring the bread into this space. And then here in the middle is an incense altar, can imagine some of the smells that went on in an animal sacrifice, but God gave them ingredients for a very specific blend of a fragrance that they were to burn in the middle of the tent as a fragrant offering to smell beautiful and pleasing, and that would burn here at all times. And then this line represents a curtain. This curtain was thick, and only one person was allowed behind the curtain, and that's the high priest. The high priest would represent the people of Israel to God. He would make atonement for their sin, payment for it. And he would represent God back to the people. So he would go in to atone, but very rarely. And then in here is the Holy of Holies. In the Holy of Holies, there was the Ark of the Covenant. Maybe you've seen Raiders of the Lost Ark. The Ark of the Covenant housed the Ten Commandments. It was plated with gold. And on top were two cherubim. And don't think like precious moments, angels. These are like tall, winged figures. And between the cherubim, 
It's called the mercy seat. And God says, between these cherubim, on the mercy seat, there I will meet with you. And from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim that are on the Ark of the Testimony, I will speak to you about all that I will give you in commandment for the people of Israel. So God's intent is to dwell here, to speak and show up and give instruction and interact with the people of Israel through their priests. That was the whole purpose of this building. And these are elaborate, detailed building instructions, but I wonder, is there anything that we can derive from it? Any principles that we can really work through to figure out how we build teams and families and homes and companies where God is pleased to dwell. The first thing that stands out to me is this. I mean, this is weird. Like, we don't do animal sacrifices. We don't even really talk about sin that much. But if you want to be a place where God will dwell, if you want to build a healthy, vibrant, functioning team or family, you've got to deal with your dirt. You have to deal with your dirt. Here, here's what I mean. It's pretty simple. All of us have stuff we bring into relationship with other people. I mean, think about how many companies or churches we've seen crumble in the last year because of the moral failures of their leaders. Or I think about in the tiny, like, close relationship of my marriage. There are things I bring into the relationship that make it hard to be close to Ryan, things like expectations that lead to resentment, or my own selfishness, or the stories I write about him that keep us separate from each other. If you want to be in the presence of God, if you want God to bless what it is you're building, you have to deal with your dirt. The same is true at work. I mean, if I'm in a healthy spot, before I go into a meeting, especially if I know it's going to be contentious or deep or intense, I want to settle in and reflect on what's going on inside of me. What am I bringing into this space? What do I need to deal with in order to be loving and transparent and honest in this space? For Israel to deal with their dirt, they, laid, they, they made a literal atonement, like a sacrifice for their sin, and then they washed their hands. But what does it look like for us to deal with our dirt? I think it's kind of intuitive and kind of simple, although very difficult to do. It means being quiet and reflective. It means confessing. It means sometimes asking for feedback for people who love us to hold up a mirror and say, what is it like to work with me? How do you experience me in conflict? What makes it difficult for us to be close or to achieve our goal in this project? And then you have to be willing to do the work. So to deal with our dirt, we reflect and we confess, and then we actually do the work to try to bring it before God and be washed pure. So if we want God to dwell with us, to be with us, we first offer him the pieces, offer the pieces of the project of whatever it is you're building, and then deal with your dirt. And then this last piece, this last step, centers on what happens in the tent, this holy space and the holy of holies and what happens in here is that we practice the presence of God. I mean, the priests in this space had very physical practices. They were offering bread and burning incense and lighting candles. But what does it look like for us to practice the presence of God, to speak and move and to worship? Now, I don't know what you think of when you think practicing the presence of God. Like, is it laying on a beach? Is it feeling peaceful? That's actually not the same thing. To practice the presence of God is like to practice the presence of a friend or a partner, some, some person who wants to be in relationship with you. To practice the presence of God, we slow down and sit in his presence. We acknowledge that he's here, that he's with us. We thank him. We confess. We say, I'm sorry. We seek his wisdom. In the church, we often call these things spiritual disciplines, practices or habits like prayer. We've talked about the Sabbath a lot throughout this series. But ways that we stop and recognize who God is, that we are not God, that we are finite, and that he speaks. Now, the Holy of Holies was not a safe place. It was a dangerous place. Not like really dangerous, I mean, I guess really dangerous, but dangerous in that the unexpected could happen. 
Remember, between the cherubim, God would speak and move. And we have to expect that if we are going into the presence of God, that he will speak to us too. And the voice of God can be disruptive. The voice of God can ask us to do things we're not comfortable doing yet. The voice of God prompts us to move beyond our comfort zone towards him. If you are listening for the voice of God, it may mean that you invite strangers into your table or your home. It may mean that you give more generously than you were planning to because you feel God nudging you to be generous. It may look like a breakup or a change in a career. I don't know what God is speaking to you, but I know that his desire is to speak. The question is, are you in his presence enough to hear and to listen? So you want to build something where God will dwell. Offer him the pieces, deal with your dirt, and practice being in his presence. Now, I told you in the past that this is a big chunk of scripture I would have breezed through, but this time when I slowed down, I saw something different. And here's what I want you to pay attention to. This, this practice, this, this idea that God wants to dwell with us, to be with us, doesn't just show up in Exodus chapter 25 for the first time. It's actually been God's design and his plan from the very beginning. In the very first pages of scripture, we have a picture of Eden, of a garden where heaven and earth meet, where God is with the man and the woman. And together in partnership, they're naming the animals and bringing life and creativity into being. It's this perfect picture. And then a serpent slithers into the scene and tries to sow seeds of doubt into the woman's mind about whether God is really good, about whether he can be trusted. And so Eve, wondering whether God's holding out, takes fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and eats. She shares it with her husband. And all of creation starts to fall apart. We call it the fall in this moment because the woman and the man who were once naked and unashamed had the urge to hide and to cover up, not just from each other, but from God. So they're separated from God. Where God was once dwelling and with and active, they're hiding and separating and pulling away from God. And he knows that they're broken now. And we're not told much about this next line, but God says, what if they try to eat from the tree of life? That means they would live forever. There's nothing wrong with living forever except if you're living forever in your broken state. So God sends them out of the garden. He says, you cannot be in my presence as you are. And at the entrance to the garden, he sets up two cherubim. And between the cherubim, there's a flaming sword to keep them from re-entering the garden and getting to the tree of life. Now, as I spoke that story, did anything sound familiar from the tabernacle imagery? I never knew this until this time around reading, but when you read about God's instructions and his design for the tabernacle, starting with the lampstand, you start to see images from the garden. So the lampstand, these seven branches that would provide light for the tent are designed like a tree with buds and flowers. And then when you look at the curtain that separates the holy of holies from the holy place, this thing that separates God's presence from everybody else into the, into the fabric are woven cherubim. And then when you make it beyond the Holy of Holies into the ark, what is seated above the ark? Two cherubim. But this time between the cherubim, there's not a flaming sword saying, keep out, you can't get to my presence. It's actually the presence of God himself between the cherubim saying, I am with you, I will dwell with you, I will speak. And what we see is this isn't just some technical building instruction. The tabernacle is actually Eden recreated among God's people. It's God's way of saying, return to the garden, return to this perfected state where we can dwell with each other. That's his plan, that's his heart, his intent to be with us. Now, Israel wanders through the desert for a long time, but when they finally take up residence in Jerusalem, they take this tabernacle and make it into a permanent structure under Solomon called the temple. The same thing is true, that God will dwell in the temple in Jerusalem. 
And there's a powerful scene in John's gospel where Jesus comes into the temple and drives out the money changers. He drives out the pigeon sellers and he says, you've made my father's house into a den of robbers. And everybody looks around at his anger and this astonishment and says, what's wrong? And he says, they say, give us some sign. Give us some sign for your power. You're condemning our temple. This is where God dwells. And Jesus says, I tell you the truth. You destroy this temple and in three days I'll build it back up. They look at him astonished and say, three days? It took 46 years to build this temple and you can build it up in three days? And what they didn't realize in that moment is that Jesus is saying, the temple is no longer a building. I am the temple. He's talking about his body, that if the temple was destroyed, he would raise it in three days. And this is so mind-blowing because what he's saying is, where heaven and earth meet, where God is dwelling and present is no longer in a building, it's in a person, and it's in the person of Jesus. Jesus is where God's desire to make us whole and complete takes place on earth. And do you remember what happens on the cross? Do you remember what happened when Jesus breathed his last? When he breathed his last and said, it is finished, that curtain in the Holy of Holies is torn in two. The veil is broken from top to bottom, from heaven to earth. God rips apart the curtain and says, the Holy of Holies is now for you. You don't have to bring your animal sacrifice. You don't have to wash clean. You don't have to do these ornate rituals. I am available to you to dwell with you in your presence because of what Jesus has done. And then it gets even better. After the resurrection, in his letter to the church at Corinth, the Apostle Paul writes this. He says, do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him for God's temple is holy and you are that temple. Do you see who the temple is now? The temple is us. Do you see where God's spirit can dwell, where God's presence can dwell? It's not a building. It's not locked into the person of Jesus. Through the Holy Spirit, God can actually dwell in us. And not just us as individuals, but us as in the body, the body of his people. He wants to be in us, moving in us, speaking to us so that we can fulfill his vision to be that blessing to the whole world. Just like with Israel, so that when people come in contact with followers of Jesus, they get a taste of Jesus himself. They get a picture of God, of his goodness and his love and his mercy and justice. That's what he's hoping for when he dwells in us that we will be him to the world. The Bible is one long story. This is what's baffling to me as we've worked our way from Genesis chapter one, from Genesis into Exodus, all the way to Revelation. It's telling one long story about how God wants to be with us and bless us. And even though the whole book ends in Revelation, you and I are still living in that story. What part are you choosing to play. If you want to be a person where God dwells, where his spirit is alive and active and speaking and working, offer up yourself, not just the pieces of whatever it is you're building. Say, God, I'm yours. My mind, my heart, my hands, I'm yours. Offer it to him. The second thing is deal with your dirt. All that means is just confess Tell God, here's how I've sinned against you. Here's how I've chosen my way over your way. This is what's in the way of you and me being close, God. Deal with your dirt and then practice his presence. Spend time with him. Read about how he's moving in the world through scripture, through other believers around the world today. Spend time singing to him and listening for his voice. Offer yourself, deal with your dirt and practice his presence. And when you do this, you will be transformed. Something will start to happen in you. You will look different, you will live different, and people around will wonder what's going on. And we go back to this idea of the tabernacle, what it would look like. But I think even more powerful is what it would smell like. I mean, 
burned meat, cooked meat, that's like barbecue. It's like standing outside a pecan lodge on Friday at noon. You smell this aroma of barbecue paired with the fragrance of the incense. And we're told in Exodus that these fragrances wafted up and they were pleasing to God, not because God likes meat, but because they represent the goodness that's happening there. And if you are offering yourself to God and God's spirit is dwelling there, you will be the aroma of Christ to a world that is breathing toxic pollution, desperately needing clean air. You will be the fragrance. People will smell something different, not because you actually smell, but because of what you do, your essence will be different in the world. Some of you remember down the street when Mrs. Baird's bread factory was there. I mean, you could smell fresh baked bread driving 75 miles an hour down Central. When you are partnering with God and living in his story and inviting his spirit to work and to move, that is how you will smell to the outside world. He wants to dwell with you. That's been his desire from the start. It's his desire today. So my question is, are you willing to let him in? And when you do, it will change everything about your life and the world around you. Let's pray. God, would you dwell in us? Would you make our lives a place where you're pleased to live and move and speak and heal and transform and all of the things that you do? God, we're so grateful we have a God who is living and active and alive and wants to be involved in our stories. Don't let us be the ones who are standing far off. So Lord, as we consider what it is we want to build, whether it's our relationships, our families, our our homes, our teams, our places of work, would you be part of that process? We don't want to build without you. How empty, how futile. Would you be honored to take up residence where we're building and in our very lives so that we might be your hands and feet, your fragrance in a hurting and broken world. Amen. Before the throne of God above, I have a strong and perfect need, a great high priest who My name is graven on his hands. My name is written on his heart. I know that while in heaven he stands, no tongue can bid me depart. No tongue can bid me depart. Satan tempts me to despair. Tells me all the guilt within Upward I look and see him there Made a man to my sin Because a sinless Savior died My sinful soul is counted free For God the just is satisfied on him and pardon me to look on him and pardon me Hallelujah Hallelujah and praise the one and praise in sight The great unchangeable I am The King of glory and all grace One with himself I cannot die My soul is purchased by his blood My life is hid with Christ on high With Christ my Savior and my God 
Who needs to hear what you just heard? And will you take the steps to share it with them this week? And will you hear this benediction? May the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you and bring you great, great peace. Amen. Amen.